We've come this morning to the Nottinghamshire villages of Low Marnham and High Marnham. We're about halfway between Newark and Retford. These are two villages, but actually it's one parish, the parish of Marnham. So we're going to start in Low Marnham, then we're going to put our mountain boots on and climb fully seven or eight feet higher into High Marnham. Why have we come here, seemingly almost in the middle of nowhere. These villages have the most fantastically interesting history. Marnham, Low Marnham with its church, was a centre of the early separatist movement. The movement where people left the Church of England and eventually which led to the Mayflower voyage. We're also going to find out about the amazing Cartwright family. Uh, explorers, inventors, revolutionary politicians, just an amazing group of people. And then we'll finish off down by the River Trent at Marnham Ferry to find out the history of one of the old Trent ferries from one village to another across England's longest river. Now we're in the churchyard of the parish church of Marnham, which is situated in Low Marnham. And at first sight, this is a classic English peaceful country scene. Uh, we have an amazingly large church and behind it is quite a, a, a well-appointed 18th century parsonage, showing that whoever was vicar here in the past was quite wealthy. But actually the importance of this place is its connection with two of the great separatist leaders of the early 1600s. And firstly, with Richard Clifton. Now Richard Clifton became famous as the rector of Babworth near Retford, uh, where the Mayflower congregation first began to gather with William Brewster and William Bradford involved. But before he ever went to Babworth, he was appointed to this living in 1585 by the Babington family, who knew him from their land ownings in Derbyshire. And he came here in 1585, uh, but it was a turbulent time in fact, and no sooner had he arrived than one of the Babington family was executed for being involved in a plot with Mary Queen of Scots, and their connection to this village came to an end. Uh, but Clifton had already established himself as a strong Puritan preacher and within the year he was off to a much better living at Babworth just outside Retford, already the centre of a radical Puritan movement. Now we're going to go a bit towards the church and we'll find out something more about the separatists and this extraordinary place. When Richard Clifton left here in 1586, it wasn't the end of Marnham Church's importance as a centre of radical Puritanism. It continued to be uh, effectively non-conformist for many years. And then in 1604, there was one of the most interesting and significant events in the sort of Puritan radical movement, when around a dozen people were arrested here for a riot. And intriguingly, most of them were clergymen. And one of them included a man called John Smith. Now what had happened was that this church had established a reputation as a centre of radical Puritan preaching and the church authorities had now started to bring it under their control. So local Puritans gathered here to support their man. One of those men who came here was John Smith. John Smith was already a preacher with a significant name in the district. He was living just across the river on the Marnham Ferry. He was able to come to and fro from South Clifton over the river. And he was one of those who was arrested here for supporting a Puritan called John Herring, who was the man they wanted to have at Marnham. Well, they seem to have lost that argument, but Herring went off to Baseford on the edge of Nottingham, where he became into fellowship with 
Thomas Helwys, another one of Smith's group who eventually were to become the first Baptists. And actually Smith was cited by the Archdeacon's Court for preaching at Herring's Church over there. It wasn't though the end of radical Puritanism here in Marnham. As late as 1621, the vicar here was in trouble again, a man named Hargreaves by that time, for holding illegal prayer meetings in his vicarage. Strange, isn't it, that a vicar should be in trouble for holding prayer meetings in his own house, but they were strange times. St Wilfrid's Low Marnham is now in the care of the Church's Conservation Trust, so we're going to be able to go inside through this rather splendid doorway. I've not really seen many doorways this sort of shape, and it's also got the king on, on one side, and on the other side, a rather worried looking bishop. So I'm not quite so sure, perhaps he's worried about the separatists. And then above the doorway, in fact, we've got perhaps the best place for the bird's nest in the, in the house. But we're gonna go in and see what we can find about the Cartwright family, because this was their local church and generations of them were buried here in graves as near to the altar as they could get themselves. Now we're inside St Wilfrid's Church at, at Marnham. Um, it's a surprisingly big church for a village that's only got a few houses, maybe reflecting intentions in medieval times that Marnham might have been a, a market town. But now it's, it's cared for by the rather excellent people at the Church's Conservation Trust, so we can get in today and it's, and it's clean and looked after. It's a very, very interesting church, but particularly because of its connection with the separatists, as we've talked about, and then later with the Cartwright family. And the Cartwright family were a family who, who did well through their local connections to Thomas Cranmer, the famous archbishop, uh, became gentry in this area for generations. And the church is covered with their memorials. There's a rather splendid one on the wall from the 1700s listing several of the daughters who died. And the church is literally carpeted with their memorials in the chancel and the sanctuary. Up against the east window, the floor is covered with cartwrights. So they're an amazing presence here. A few other interesting curios we might like are some medieval stained glass. Uh, there's the rather odd image of a drowning man in the wall, which I think is perhaps an accident of some careless rendering done in the past. And there's an old funeral beer that used to be used for moving the coffins uh, from the house to the church and the graveyard, which is still here. So it's a fascinating church, but our main interest is in the Cartwright family. And now we're standing at the chancel step in St Wilfrid's Marnham, and we're looking for the signs of the Cartwright family, who were of course the most important gentry here for a long time. In the, in the chancel, we've got the gravestone of Francis Cartwright, died in 1834. And then on the chancel wall, we've got two memorials to relatively young members of the family who, who died in the 1700s. Fairly typical for an English parish church. What is so unusual here, and I find quite amusing in a way, is that the whole of the sanctuary is carpeted with their gravestones. They have packed themselves in as close to the altar as possible. Maybe they still held on to the old medieval tradition that the closer you were buried to the altar, the more chance you had of getting to heaven. I somehow doubt that John Smith and Richard Clifton would have gone along with such a belief. But here they all are to this day. But we're also interested in the lives of some of the Cartwright family because in the mid 1700s they produced a golden generation one of whom was Edmund Cartwright who for a little while was actually vicar of this church as well so we're going to hear a little bit more about his life in his church. Well, it may look a bit odd doing a history video from a pulpit, but there's actually a very good reason when we come to talk about Edmund 
Cartwright. Edmund Cartwright was the fourth son in a generation of the Cartwrights that proved to be their golden generation. And as, as a fourth son of the Gentry family, he could have gone into the army or the navy, but he followed the alternative, which was to go into the church. Uh, Edmund Cartwright was a very clever man. He had a lot of interests uh, in farming, in medicine, in science, and he also actually had plenty of money because he had a rich wife to help fund his activities. He was vicar here in Marnham from 1771 to 9 and actually in several other local parishes at various times. But that's not why he's famous. He's famous for one of the most important inventions of the Industrial Revolution. And it came about because in 1784, he spent a holiday at Matlock in Derbyshire and got talking to some men from Manchester who were in the cotton industry and talked about the problem with weaving mechanically. This was the great new invention they needed. Cotton spinning had been mechanised, weaving not. And so Cartwright, an amateur country clergyman, decided he would try to solve the problem. And within a year had actually invented the power loom and patented it. This was a major step forward in the Industrial Revolution. But actually, he didn't do very well out of it. Uh, despite patenting it, his uh, looms were copied widely by the men from Manchester who didn't pay him any money for it. And his own attempts, sometimes with his brother, to set up cotton mills in Retford and Doncaster ended in financial failure. So he didn't really do very well from his inventions. He went on to invent other machines, a rope making machine and a wool combing machine. And eventually his importance was recognised by Parliament, which voted him a pension as gratitude from a nation which had remorselessly pirated his inventions on proper terms, I suppose. So he became a well-known inventor, a huge importance. And he was also the father of a daughter, Elizabeth, who married a, local, a clergyman from Cornwall, Mr Penrose, and actually became very, very famous as the Victorian writer, Mrs Markham. But we'll talk about her another day. Well, we've come the half mile or so from Low Marnham to High Marnham. We've come up the hill, I suppose it's about 10 feet high, and now we're outside Marnham Hall, the ancestral home of the Cartwright family, a house that stayed in their family up until 1788. And the house that you can see here today, largely rebuilt in about 1789, after the estate had moved into the ownership of the Earl Brownlow. But some interesting things have happened here at Marnham Hall. Perhaps the most strange though was that in the 1780s it was visited by five Inuit Eskimos who came here to stay for several months. How did they end up in a place like Marnham? Well of course it's connected to the extraordinary Cartwright family. George Cartwright, the second son of that golden generation, had a career in the military and then he became an explorer exploring parts of Newfoundland and Labrador, partly with his brother John. And that is why you can find a town in Labrador called Cartwright with a memorial to these two brothers. George came back from Labrador bringing some Inuit with him and they were the sensation of London uh, before also coming to stay here. Though sadly Four of them died of smallpox that they caught while they were in Britain. And then the disease spread back to uh, the people in Labrador as well. But George became something of an eccentric local celebrity. Uh, he was famous for, for his links to the Eskimos. Apparently in Mansfield, where he settled, his feats of Herculean strength were, made him amazingly popular. And then later in life, he wrote a book about his exploits as an explorer in Labrador. So a great character. 
but he did run into money difficulties, which is why he had to uh, mortgage the estate here, and it was only rescued for the Cartwright family by his brother John uh, buying it back, temporarily, as we shall see. So we're now going to go in and have a look at the grounds and a closer look at this fine historic building. Well, we're now at the front of Marnham Hall, this ancestral home of the Cartwright family. And for a time it was owned by George Cartwright until his financial difficulties, then transferred to John Cartwright, more famously known in history textbooks as Radical Jack. And his life was just another example of this extraordinary generation of Cartwrights. John Cartwright went into the Navy, again a typical career for a younger son of the gentry. But he had to leave the Navy in 1770 because his radical opinions about the American campaign uh, made him rather a dangerous person to be a British naval officer. So he left the Navy, uh, spent a bit of time exploring with his brother, but became most famous for radical politics. Uh, and he became a campaigner on a number of issues, reform of parliament, the slave trade, independence for Greece, which was another popular issue at the time, and was in and out of radical politics for many, many years, earning himself the enmity of other local gentry, particularly the Duke of Newcastle over at Clumber Park, for, for example. Uh, he was involved in the famous events at Peterloo, uh, survived Peterloo, in fact, only to be arrested soon afterwards and put in prison for sedition at the age of over 80. Uh, when he was uh, near the end of his life, Thomas Jefferson wrote to him from America and made a comment about that they would soon be able to both discuss the principles of good government in heaven. And in fact, both of them would die, died very soon after that. So Radical Jack is famous as an example of an English radical politician from the early 19th century. And he lived here for a brief time. In fact, he actually made quite a lot of money after leaving Marnham Hall, which he sold to Earl Brownlow, moved into Lincolnshire and made a lot of money out of farming woad at a place called brother toft. In between he also lost money trying to run a textile business with his brother Edmund and that is why Marnham Hall is such an interesting historic house. Well we've come down through High Marnham past the Brownlow Arms pub, just a few houses really. The idea of making Marnham into a market town never really succeeded and all it was left with was a little bit of trade on the river. So we've come down to the Trent to see what we can find of Marnham Ferry. But it's an amazingly interesting spot. We've got the remains of the High Marnham Power Station, further in the distance, Cotton Power Station, both sort of 1950s uh, major projects. The amazing Fledborough Viaduct right across the floodplain here, which leads to Clifton Church, where John Smith, the famous early Baptist, uh, lived for a couple of years and was probably the schoolmaster and clerk. So it's an amazingly interesting place. But the ferry was never really very successful, although King Edward II actually did use it to cross the Trent in the early 1100s. So I'm going to go closer to the river to see what we can find about the ferry and how this river has kept changing its course over the years. Well, we've come right down to the, beside the River Trent to see if we can find the ferry. And I can see some ducks, I can see some swans, 
but there's no ferry here today. It looks like I might have to wait a very long time if I want to cross the river. But actually, this was just a little local ferry, the type that existed every few miles along the Trent. But it's one we know a bit about because of its interesting traditions that existed. For example, if you lived on that side of the river at South Clifton, you were expected to buy the ferryman what was called a prime loaf every year. And if you bought him one of those, you got free passage across the ferry for that year. So it's interesting to wonder if the radical clergyman John Smith took advantage of that offer when he was going to and fro to visit his friend John Herring at Marnham Vicarage. We don't know, but I think he probably did. Another curious tradition was that the local vicar at Clifton was expected to provide the ferryman and his dog with Christmas dinner every year as part of the bargain. And we have quite an amusing description of the ferryman and his dog being fed at the vicarage, but the vicar's dog was kicked out so that the ferryman's dog could have his Christmas dinner in peace. A nice little tradition down beside the river here. Now we're going to wander along and find out a little bit more about the River Trent, which over the centuries has changed its course many times. I've just come up from the, the ferry down there onto the, the Trent flood bank and it's a good place to reflect on the fascinating history of this river, a river which has changed its course many times. In fact, 10,000 years or so ago, it probably flowed from here over towards Lincoln rather than northwards towards the Humber. If I'd been in this spot maybe two or three hundred years ago, I would actually have been in the middle of the river. And you might say, well, that doesn't look very likely. Well, if we look over here, what we can find is an old meander of the River Trent, going several miles round closer to Marnham and further to the south. And you can see here the channel full of stinging nettles now, maybe just a little bit of water, but very clearly an old part of the river. And up and down this valley there are many, many channels like this, lost channels of the River Trent. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our visit to Marnham. I'm standing at the High Marnham sign, uh, a lot of the local equivalent of trees, the pylons around me buzzing away with the, with the wires. If you've enjoyed our visit, don't forget to like us and subscribe on YouTube. And if you want to know more about Marnham, John Smith and Richard Clifton, then try our book Restless Souls Pilgrim Roots, which is a comprehensive history of the Christian uh, activists and, and, and life over several centuries in Nottinghamshire and, and Lincolnshire. But thank you for being with us uh, for this film. <laughs>